actually, uh, we call this one phase two of our, of our presentations on this topic. Um, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about the Indian River Lagoon. A lot of you know about the lagoon uh, from previous lectures and from just living near here. Uh, but I'll, I'll mention a couple of things there. I'll mention something called ERLO, the Indian River Lagoon Observatory. Then I'm going to get us into the technology, the LOBO approach and the pilot project. And I'm going to, um, we're going to talk about where we're going in terms of the network and our next steps. And actually, this is uh, kind of the second in the series. The first one was uh, two Januarys ago, beginning of the lecture series last year. And um, this is an opportunity for me to say that a lot of things that we talked about then, we're not talking about tonight. So I went in fair, fair amount of detail about water quality and what it was and why it mattered, gave a lot of examples, gave you more background information. Um, if you want to see that old lecture, uh, you can go. Uh, this is the, the uh, place on the internet. Um, or you can just Google Harbor Branch Ocean Science Lecture Series. And you'll actually see that most of our lectures, you know, we tape them, usually at the 7 o'clock um, show here. Brian Cousin in the background, a, a world-class videographer. He's always great to work with. And uh, so for those of you who are traveling or if you're here year-round and you maybe missed something, you want to see it again, or you have friends that live somewhere else, you can always uh, send them to that web page, and you'll find most of our lectures. So if you want to, if you want to get some of the introductory uh, material, you're more than welcome to do that. And we actually made a one-page handout that's on either side of the podium. You can take it with you if you want to try to actually uh, find it directly that way. But it is easy to find. You just go to the Harbor Branch website look for the lecture series. So I think uh, from the series and, and just from living here, you know, there's, there's enormous uh, number of issues that are facing the lagoon. A lot of concerns out there. Uh, and it runs anything from too much fresh water to poor water quality, various contaminants. Historically, there was a tremendous loss of habitat when the series first developed. Uh, we tend to forget that now because it happened quite a while ago. Um, there's a loss of fisheries, uh, commercial fisheries, um, to some extent recreational fisheries. And uh, from some of the other work that's been done here at Harbor Branch and elsewhere, you know about a lot of emerging diseases in uh, marine mammals, for example. So again, I'm not going to go into any detail, just to say there's a lot of these issues. A lot of them tie back to water quality. A lot of them tie back to not having enough information at the right time and in the right place. Hence, a few years ago, we started the concept of the Indian River Lagoon Observatory. And uh, the key words in, the, in our description up there is it's meant to be long term. There's a lot of variability in the lagoon. It's not the same lagoon every day. You know, Chris and I go out in the field a lot, and we always say you never know what you're going to see each day. Each day there's something different. No two days in the field are alike. But the worst day in the field, of course, is better than any day back in the office. Um, it's multidisciplinary. It's not just biology or chemistry or physics. It's the integration of all of them. It can, it's an ecosystem-based program, which, again, is very integrated. It's not just the seagrasses or just the dolphins. It's, it's everything, them and everything that's interconnected. It's the food chain that's both in the plankton and the water column and in the benthos. And we're really focused on these concerns that I showed in the first slide of environmental health, where our goal is really to better understand the system. I mean, I just want to know, how does any river lagoon work? How does it function? Um, and if we understand that, then we have a much better chance of understanding, for example, the seagrass die-off or the mysterious uh, die-off of of mammals and pelicans and so on. Um, the bottom line is we just don't know enough about how the lagoon actually works. We tend to just look at little parts at different times, different places. And then the last key item here is we want to know how this interfaces with us, you know, the human population. We know that we've impacted nature quite a lot, yet we all know that we're part of nature, right? So it's a kind of a tricky proposition. Um, so ultimately we want to acquire and disseminate data. So that's important not only get it, but disseminate it. That's one of the reasons we're doing this lecture tonight, is to try to share this stuff with you as quickly as we can uh, on, on this knowledge about how the system works and how it might be better managed. That's what we're trying to do overall in that program. There's three key parts. One I've kind of already talked about a lot, long-term, multidisciplinary, ecosystem-based approach. So you know, for example, we have some of the dolphin programs here, the photo ID program. You've heard lectures about that. Some of Brian LaPointe's work, some of my work, uh, and so on. Um, Collaboration among organizations. Perhaps the best example of this is the Indian Lagoon Symposium, which some of you have been at. We've had it now four years each February. Uh, in the last three years, we've had a public 
component on the second day. And, the, and that's changed a little bit each year based on you know, what the concerns are from the, the public and what some of the opportunities are to, to educate everybody. And then uh, the part that we're really going to focus on tonight is a network of advanced observing stations. So this is really talking about using new technology to uh, address uh, a better understanding of the lagoon. And last, last time I talked about this, I went in much greater detail about some work that now Kristen and I have been doing for 10 years, uh, almost, not quite. Um, and um, this is a network of stations from uh, Grand Harbor, which is north of Vero Beach, uh, down to almost the Fort Pierce Inlet by St. Lucie Village. This is Harbor Branch. This is Vero Beach in here. And it's basically a series of stations that have to do with discharges from these main relief canals that drain most of Indian River County. And actually, 10 years ago, had been very little studied. And that's why one day, instead of working, like say, the St. Lucie Estuary, when we first got this funded with the state, I said, you know, it really might be interesting to, to look, you know, more locally right here um, at this very interesting uh, water quality gradient, uh, which is not well documented at the time, and also uh, specifically seagrass resources. So I've shown these graphs the last time I talked, which basically summarizes a lot of data, makes these nice little bar graphs. And you can see there's, there's big patterns from Vero Beach to the south. So, you know, as you get closer to the ocean, you have less freshwater impacts, you have more salinity from, from the ocean exchange. Um, nutrients are highest whenever you have freshwater uh, coming in. So nutrients are elevated at Vero Beach, less so in Fort Pierce, um, and so on. Chlorophyll A, which is the algal pigment uh, in the water, responds quickly to those nutrient additions, and so on. And I'm a plant guy, so we also measure how fast these things uh, change the, the light getting down to the seagrass. So that's what light attenuation coefficient is. And we've seen, we've seen enormous patterns. Let me just take one that everybody understands, and that's salinity. And like I say, this is our long-term average for almost 10 years. And what a shocker, right? Uh, it's salter near the ocean. OK? And the error bars are really, really tight. That means I'm really sure about that. OK, I'm very certain of that. But you all knew that anyway. And, uh, but a lot of times, this is what you see. And a lot of times, uh, the agencies, when they do their water sampling, they only do it quarterly, four times a year. Uh, more intensively is once a month. We're doing this based on once a week measurements, which I used to say was intense. Uh, now you'll see that that's not intense anymore with what we're doing now. This is really, I think, uh, tells us a lot more about salinity in this area than is that slide. That shows us the overall patterns. This shows you the enormous amount of variability that occurs throughout time anywhere from 15 parts per thousand to over, you know, like 42 parts per thousand. The ocean is about 35. So sometimes it's actually hypersaline here. And this has to do, of course, with what happens on land in terms of rain and freshwater discharges. So a lot of these dips in salinity that can have pretty significant impacts in the lagoon are due to those types of rain events. Now, to my regret, we did not start this in 2004 when we had the twin hur hurricanes. I would love to have had that data. We don't have it. We have Hurricane Wilma. We have a few tropical storms and, a, and an isolated hurricane here and there, but not, not as significant as what happened in 2004. But we've had some, some really interesting events. Some of them are out of season, like some unusual events of rain in March 2010, which had a pretty significant impact on water quality locally. Um, and this really kind of is just the background for saying, that to really understand changes and how we might change it with our management actions, we really need to have a better understanding of this variability. And basically, the more data we can get, the better we can understand it. Um, my last point on this is just to remind everybody that we do get major storm events on average every couple years. And that actually, during this 10-year period of time, except for the first year, we've actually been in a drought situation. And that's why we got some of this hypersailing environment situations that I talked about. And actually, that's been good for water quality because we've actually had less freshwater rain runoff than we would have had. So our rainfall has been on the order of a 10 to 15 percent reduction over the previous 50-year average. So it's, it's not a trivial change that we're starting to see. This leads us to Lobos. This is our, our new technology that we've been trying to incorporate that when I last spoke up here, I presented it as, this is a pilot project. This is what we want to do. Here's where we're starting. And I think I have to look back, but I don't think we had projected anything like what I'm going to tell you about uh, tonight, because a lot happened in the intervening uh, year, year. 
Uh, so, um, in brief, we are in the process of establishing a network of this instrumentation that will have, ultimately will have 10, 10 stations uh, throughout the lagoon from uh, Sebastian Inlet down to St. Lucie Inlet in the lagoon in the St. Lucie estuary. Currently, we have four sites that have been installed and actually are generating live data online that any of you can see at any time. Uh, most recently, one up here at Sebastian came online just earlier this week. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of give you an overview of the technology. So keywords in what we're doing with the technology is real time. By that I mean that 20 minutes after every hour, you'll know what the water quality was 20 minutes ago. I'll explain later why it takes 20 minutes. Because, um, you know, we all get impatient these days, right? 20 minutes. Jeez. Um, high accuracy, high resolution. That means we want the data to be correct. We want them to be accurate. We want them to be precise. We want them to be repeatable. In other words, if we did it the same exact time, we should get the same exact numbers with similar technologies and so on. That's really important. Uh, the agencies, especially like the DEP that we're working with in the St. Lucie Estuary, their expression for that is data usability. They want to make sure that we have proper quality assurances, quality control in place so that they can use it for whatever reason they want. Okay, so we have to meet a lot of different standards. And like I said, uh, it's going to be available online through a dedicated interactive website, which means it's open to everybody all the time. Okay, not just us. Here's the parameters, and last time I went in great detail about them. Let me just step through them real quickly. Uh, temperature, you all know temperature, how hot, how cold it is. Uh, some of you may remember in 2010 and 2011 when we had historically cold temperatures. Northern part of the lagoon got down to 4 degrees centigrade. It's the coldest that's ever been recorded in Brevard County since, since they've been keeping records. Our water right out here in St. Lucie County was at its 50-year low. Okay, so that was a pretty significant event. There was strandings of turtles that were stunned. There was this relief effort up and down the lagoon. Uh, there was dead manatees. There was massive fish kills. Okay, and uh, and some of us believe that it had a lot to do with what happened the following year with uh, with the with the uh, super bloom to the north. Uh, salinity. We already talked about that, but you know that's basically the salt water, the fresh water mixing together. Some indicator of salt content. Really important for distribution of marine plants and animals. Depth, we use depth primarily as a, as a way to look at tides. Because you know tides come and go high and low twice a day, most places. And uh, that's, that's important in terms of physical oceanography and circulation, as is current speed and direction. And the next parameter is dissolved oxygen. I think we all know that uh, all plants and animals need, uh, need oxygen, need dissolved oxygen. Sometimes we think, oh, plants, they make oxygen. Well, yeah, they do during the day. But at night, they're just like animals. They're respiring. So um, they, too, need oxygen. You know about fish kills, especially if you live here in the summertime. That's when they usually happen, because that's when we tend to have low DO. So in the newspaper, it almost always is the agencies came in. And they said, yeah, it's low oxygen. OK, so that's a really important parameter. Uh, the next three I kind of always group together, because they all are important in terms of reducing the amount of light available. In the, in the water. And why do I care about that? Well, I'm basically a plant guy. I'm a seagrass person. And seagrasses have a very high light requirement. And I've talked about that in previous lectures as well. And what reduces that light or attenuates that light is things like turbidity. And turbidity is the particles that are in the water, the very fine particles. And some of them, almost all of them, come in from terrestrial sources over a long period of time through those canals and other, other sources. And uh, there's a lot of it that stays in the lagoon. We call that legacy sediment or legacy load. And so, for example, when the wind starts to blow from the north in the wintertime, one of the things you'll very quickly see is the clear water becomes kind of dirty. And you see these particles in the water. And that's basically resuspension of those particles. And collectively, that can be measured as turbidity. We can also talk about watercolor, uh, which is kind of what I like to say. If you feel like you have to put a lot of words in your mouth, you can say, chromophoric dissolved organic matter, or you can abbreviate it and say CDOM. Um, so I'll go back and forth probably between CDOM and watercolor. But that's, the, that's like if you know Taylor Creek, uh, north end of Fort Pierce. You can go down there and see that coke color water comes out. It's in sharp contrast to the blue water that comes in from the ocean. I always take students there because it's the best, best place to see that locally. But you can see it in all the other uh, freshwater areas as well, just not quite as dramatic. 
So that's actually like tea in a way. It's phenolic substances that leach out from decaying vegetation from land and uh, freshwater sources. So it's actually a natural decay product. But you can use it really as a good tracer, a good, good uh, measurement of freshwater inputs. So when I see it, I know I don't have to measure salinity. I know there's fresh water that's coming in higher than, than, a, than a certain amount. Chlorophyll A, I already mentioned, is a, is a pigment. It's, uh, it's how we assess the, the phytoplankton or the microscopic algae in the water. Uh, this includes things like harmful algal blooms. So some of you know about red tides and certain other things that are toxic or can be toxic. So a lot of times that's an important uh, parameter for people to measure. It's also just important in terms of understanding e e eco ecological function. Uh, so filter feeders, uh, clams, you know, they also depend on chlorophyll A. So what's most exciting to me is the ones that are on the bottom of the list, nutrients, nitrate, inorganic nitrogen, and phosphate. And, you know, nitrogen and phosphate have been in the news quite a lot. You know, but the fertilizer bans that all came about in the last two years, and they specifically target nitrate and phosphate. Okay. And why it's cool to me is because a long time ago when I was a graduate student, I used to do all the manual chemistry for all these parameters, but including the nutrients in a little basement, uh, a little house on the University of Rhode Island property. And it was kind of dark down there. and Not many people went down there. And we always had these odors that come from all the chemicals that we were using at the time. And of course, eventually I, I grew out of that and I could hire somebody to do that work <laughs> later. And then eventually, of course, we were able to get uh, either an auto analyzer or able to send it to a lab that had an auto analyzer. And these things were all done automatically, right? no more manual chemistry. Uh, that takes a lot of time, though, to get those data back. It takes, you know, weeks. Sometimes it might take a month, six weeks. Okay, and we're talking now about being able to go out in the environment and get those numbers right now, real time. And it's, to me, it's just an incredible change from when I started out. So that's, that's what we can do. Here's what the equipment looks like very quickly. It's a package of sensors. Uh, it's all connected to uh, the brain. This is called the Storex. It's a data logger. So all the sensors feed their information there. And then it feeds the information um, out to the world. And we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail later. We have something called the WQMX on one end. If you know what a CTD is, CTD is conductivity or salinity, temperature, and depth. Uh, it measures those parameters. It also measures oxygen. And on the opposite end of it, it has three optical sensors that measure those three attenuators of light that I'm so interested in. So it measures turbidity. It measures chlorophyll A, and it measures CDOM, or watercolor. Not seen in this view, but you'll see it in the next slide, is the SUNA. The SUNA, just like the last suite of sensors, is also an optical sensor. So even, even more incredible to me that we can get these numbers is that there, you can send a little beam of light out, and it can pick up just one ion that's present in very small quantities, nitrate, and give us really good data. Um, that's incredible to me. We still have some old school chemistry in a way uh, that we have this one unit, the cycle phosphate, which actually I call chemistry in the can because it's still doing all those things that I used to do back in that uh, cellar at URI, except it's miniaturized. It has reagents that last for up to three months as opposed to when I do it in the lab, even now, you're supposed to remake them every six, six hours. But proprietary chemistry now allows it to be done uh, much, much, uh, or a much longer period of time. And the reason there's a 20 minute delay in time is because that's still a chemical reaction that requires uh, a, a change in color and the color to be measured by a miniature spectrophotometer inside that package. So to me, again, uh, when I look over my career, I look at this, I think, boy, I wish I could have had that uh, a long time ago. This is what it looks like when it goes out fresh. Um, you'll see that, I mean, this will be explained a little bit more later. Um, that everything is taped um, and painted with anti-fouling uh, paint. Uh, the reason we do that is we actually violate the warranty if we actually paint the instrument. But also it allows us to have these layers that we can peel off and put new layers on. When we have a lot of fouling, we can just kind of restart the, restart the clock on the fouling. There's a lot of other devices on there to reduce fouling, which as you'll see shortly, is one of our biggest challenges in the lagoon. The communication with the world is through an antenna um, that basically sends a cell phone call once an hour and uh, goes to a server. And 20 minutes later, it's basically available uh, for anybody to go on a public website and get the information. This particular one, we also have a weather station. 
So this may, you may recognize this as some wind measurements and precipitation measurements. We have a light sensor. We measure temperature and so on. So like a traditional weather station. That's, uh, that's when we have everything together at one spot. This is the website. You can, uh, if you remember just uh, FAU LoboViz, you can find it very quickly. Um, or you can just Google uh, Harbor Branch Lobo, Harbor Branch Water Quality, and you very quickly will be able to get to this page, um, which looks a little bit different than this, this old layout. But basically, you can see any of the station information in real time by going to that page. And if you find the tab up top that says Lobo Vig, it's the second tab. You can go there and you can access all of our archived data. And you can, you can download it, you can save it, you can play with it right online, or you can put it in a different program. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, we want people to use it as much as you can. Um, and our goal here at Harbor Ranch really is to better, like I said, better understand the lagoon, to better quantify and model relationships between environmental factors and biological processes. We think by having a network of stations, this takes away the need, for example, for all the biologists to go out and do the same measurements over and over again. It allows, say, graduate students to come in and focus with a particular group of organisms uh, and have all this background data uh, that they can rely on and they can put more emphasis on the, in the work that they're, that they're primarily here to do. So one of the reasons I really wanted to share the podium uh, this week is because I, I want to make it really clear that uh, doing this project is a huge team effort. And uh, so the two folks that are here tonight, Kristen and Ben, have, have been key to where we are and to where we're going. So I first want to introduce Ben Metzger. Uh, ben uh, grew up in Arizona. And he got his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Northern Arizona University. And then he spent some time in Oregon. He was first hired here to work for ORA. If you don't know ORA, it uh, used to be a subsidiary of Old Harbor Branch. Um, it's on its own now. And it's uh, the largest uh, producer of marine ornamental uh, fishes. And uh, I first met Ben when he, when he would come over where I was growing seaweeds. And I would talk to him and uh, found out that he really wanted to be an engineer. He was hoping to be an engineer someday at Harbor Branch. And I said, Ben, I think you'll be an engineer here someday at Harbor Branch. And what I didn't tell him that then was, and I said, I hope someday he can work for me. Honestly, Ben, I couldn't figure out how I could ever have an engineer work with me, though. But you have shown me how to do that, so I need to thank him. He has worked in our engineering group for about six years. Um, he works in all phases of engineering, design, sensor deployment, system testing, and field operations. And that's exactly what he's been doing for us. And he's in heavy demand by, uh, by a lot of folks here at Harbor Branch. So Ben's going to take a, a few minutes and tell you about a few things. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Can everyone hear me? OK, good. Uh, so Dennis showed you a picture of, uh, of the Lobo installation down at the end of the channel at Harbor Branch. Uh, the big piling down at the, the end of the Harbor Branch channel uh, was an existing piling. And so we had the luxury of putting nice platform on there, uh, uh, weather station array, uh, all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, now, as we expand the Lobo network, we kind of need a more flexible um, uh, deployment platform, I guess you could say, for these sensors. Uh, so we've... Um, uh, decided to, uh, rather than installing our own pilings, um, which would require DEP and uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineer uh, permitting approvals, uh, we'll just try and use existing uh, Coast Guard ATON pilings, aid to navigation pilings, uh, essentially channel markers on the edges of the ICW. Uh, be much, much more efficient, uh, uh, faster, no permitting involved, um, but we will need Coast Guard approval to do this. Uh, so the Coast Guard has been very gracious in allowing us to install this equipment on some of their pilings here uh, with the following restrictions. Uh, the equipment cannot ha uh, hinder any operation of the uh, pilings. You have, we have to keep all the signs visible, um, no holes. Uh, you know, basically just don't mess with the pilings, keep it open to the Coast Guard to uh, uh, service it as they usually do. And we have to uh, be able to easily remove the, uh, our equipment uh, in the event of uh, decommissioning of the piling or for any other reason here. 
so uh, at Harbor Branch, we have a nice fleet of small boats, and we're able to um, both service and install all these systems uh, with the boats, uh, including a, a deck boat we call the RV Beezer, uh, named after one of the engineers here at Harbor Branch. And it's a nice deck boat, a, a, a generous slot in the bow that allows us to access all kinds of things in the water and out. Um, and uh, with, a, with a good team of four folks, we can install these systems in less than half a day per site. And we do not need any divers in the water uh, either for, uh, either for uh, the uh, system installation or for the maintenance. Um, so I'll take you through a, just a, a typical installation here of one of these systems. Uh, we'll, we'll go, um, we'll, first we'll identify a region of interest and then we'll go out, out to the site and uh, take a look at all the pilings in the area. We'll look for a good, healthy, uh, sturdy, sturdy piling there. Uh, in this case, piling number 64 up in Sebastian Inlet was our perfect candidate here. That's our northernmost site at the moment. And uh, we'll, we'll go just take some measurements, physical measurements of the uh, piling water depth, take some underwater video just to make sure we're not getting any, um, we don't have any underwater uh, uh, obstructions uh, to have to work around. Uh, we'll go back, take these measurements, do, do a kind of a quick design here. We've kind of evolved the design from this big piling with uh, ladders and things uh, to something that we can uh, service without having to go up on pilings, just kind of pull up on the boat, uh, connect interface with the um, instruments. It, it kind of turns out to be this like uh, unitized frame, I-beam frame construction here with all the telemetry equipment up on the top here, uh, including solar panel for uh, powering the system. Uh, and then coming down here, we see the, uh, the Lobo instrument that Dennis mentioned there. Uh, we deploy it on an I-beam so it can kind of uh, just ride up and down as, as we need to get it in and out of the water very easily without any divers or anything like that. So it uh, keeps the, the, the system secure uh, where we want it all the time. Uh, we'll come back, do some drawings, uh, hand it off to these guys. These guys are, our, uh, among other things, fabrication ninjas here at Harbor Branch. These guys are awesome. Uh, they can uh, weld anything from titanium to stainless steel, uh, aluminum. Uh, here we see uh, on the left-hand side Dave Bourdette uh, attacking this I-beam uh, with a, a MIG gun, fantastic welder. Jeff Smith on the right-hand side of all things silver soldering a copper uh, piece that we uh, have used to troubleshoot some foul biofouling issues at our site. Jeff's an amazing welder here uh, at Harbor Branch. And we use, we use copper extensively in the system. Uh, as it is a, a great um, biofouling, uh, anti-biofouling material. Um, so we will do a verification of all the sensors before deployment. Uh, Kristen will talk about that in a little bit here. Um, and then after that, we uh, will need to prep all these sensors for uh, what's, what, hopes to, what we hope to be a very long deployment out in the river, uh, up to six months for, per sensor. Um, uh, for a pretty long deployment out there. Uh, we'll tape them up, as Dennis mentioned, and this allows us to slap a coat of uh, this green anti-fouling paint on there, uh, which is uh, very similar to what you'd put on the bottom of your boat. It's a copper-based paint, and it just keeps, the, keeps a lot of the um, invertebrates from settling out on the, on the surfaces of the sensors, uh, keeping them fairly clean for as long as possible. Um, so we'll take uh, all of our fabricated hardware here uh, and kind of assemble that. You can see uh, this is this is that that main frame of the uh, the uh, unitized system here. These are the newer newer systems. Uh, we'll have a mast on top for clamping uh, the solar panel, power supply, uh, and telemetry equipment here. Uh, clamps. These guys will go around the uh, wooden aton piling or uh, steel piling I beams in, in some cases. Uh, you can see a trolley system here. That's what we uh, bolt the Lobo uh, sensor frame uh, package onto here, and that allows a, it, it. It allows us to, as I said, drop this thing down the I beam flange here for easy uh, launch and recovery of the system. We'll then uh, come over and assemble each sensor. Uh, we, we, we do a number of things uh, here to prevent uh, biofouling, wrapping uh, cables and copper tape. I've uh, become a big fan of copper tape here over the last uh, uh, year or so. Um, it's great for keeping uh, critters from growing on things. Um, and uh, let's see. So before we deploy any of the, any of the systems uh, in the river, uh, we do initial tests in the labs here. Uh, we'll throw the system in the tank. 
um, kind of simulated deployment. And it, by doing this, we can identify any tr any problems that might pop up. It's a lot easier to troubleshoot and fix problems uh, here in the um, uh, on-site at Harbor Branch here rather than having to troubleshoot in the field. Uh, so uh, you can see on the left-hand side, we've got uh, our sensors in the tank. Um, and uh, we'll do a check out of about a couple days, maybe a week at most, just to make sure everything's talking properly to one another. Um, and it's transmitting data as we expect here. Uh, you can see some of the telemetry equipment uh, over here. Uh, so just, just to kind of uh, give you kind of an insight as to what the installation entails here, we'll walk through, uh, through an installation. Uh, again, this is piling 64 up Sebastian uh, Inlet. It's just south of the St. Sebastian River uh, out, outlet there. Uh, beautiful day here. We, we'll pull up to the piling. Um, and this is, uh, I, I really wish we had Brian Cousin on, out on some of these sites here. He could have gotten some really good, good shots. But uh, it's, we, like I said, take four people out there. And everyone's involved in stepping this uh, I-beam up here. So that's the next step. We'll get the I-beam uh, kind of situated up, on, up in place. Uh, on the piling and jump ahead a little bit. It will uh, start clamping things up here. Uh, this, this photo actually shows a different uh, site. This is uh, Fort Pierce, our Fort Pierce Inlet site, which is a, a steel I-beam. So the, the clamps, they can be used on wooden or steel, whatever, um, uh, different, different materials. Uh, so uh, uh, some of our great uh, uh, folks here, Harbor Branch, Dave, and again on the right, there's Jimmy Nelson, um, also uh, Small Boats Marine Manager. Very helpful guy here on this project. Uh, you can see we're working in that slot of the bow. The, the uh, uh, RVBs are uh, both there. So then uh, we'll we'll throw up a temporary platform here, just kind of a bolt-on thing, and that uh, isolates uh, the folks who are installing the system up up on top of the piling uh, to any rocking of the ship, making for a much more enjoyable and uh, safer installation process. Uh, we'll put a uh, like a temporary crane up there, uh, up up into the mast, and just use a simple uh, four to one pulley system to kind of hoist uh, this, the uh, pieces up one by one, clamping them up onto the mast. There, uh, this is the power supply enclosure, modem uh, enclosure, uh, 3G modem antenna going up on there, uh, clamped in place, and and we'll bring up this beautiful 90 watt solar panel uh, to power the system for uh, for its life up there. Um, we'll uh, just you know finish wiring up there and then bring um, uh, the cables down through this uh, uh, PVC conduit down into the um, uh, Lobo sensors and connect that up to the instrumentation. Make sure everything's connected right. Uh, program the uh, system uh, for deployment mode, and we will lower it down onto the I beam here, Kristen. Uh, is taking advantage of that. Uh, again, that 4 to 1 pulley system, just dropping it down. It's about 150 pound instrumentation package, and uh, she's easy, easily doing that uh, by herself there uh, as we guide it down the rail. Uh, and this is what it kind of looks like down there. This is, I believe that's a photo of the Sebastian site. Uh, and you can see how it just kind of, just kind of captured uh, by the uh, trolley wheels there. So uh, stable position, it's not gonna move around or anything. Um, and he's easy to uh, uh, recover. Uh, so this is again uh, just a look at the uh, installations here. You can see the uh, submerged instrumentation down below and our main frame on the I-beam, solar panel telemetry up on top there. Uh, totally unobstructed view of the signs uh, from any direction. Uh, this is actually our Vero Beach site. It's a pretty cool site just north of the Oslo uh, boat ramp there. Uh, so all of our future sites here that we have planned for the uh, St. Lucie Estuary will be uh, very similar to the ones we have in the past. It seems to be a pretty efficient uh, way to, to uh, deploy these systems uh, with the addition of a uh, weather station up here. So as Dennis mentioned, wind speed direction, uh, PAR sensors, um, and uh, you know, the usual suspects, their uh, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure. So one of the main challenges here with all these uh, uh, systems obviously is the uh, they're in a pretty hostile environment. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of cool critters out there that want to colonize any clean uh, surface. So uh, what starts out as like just this beautiful uh, piece of artwork here uh, quickly becomes uh, kind of a condo or apartment building for all kinds of critters. We've got uh, barnacles. Uh, uh, we've got tunicates. Um, 
we get uh, mud and sand, uh, muck kind of uh, settling on every available surface. Uh, barnacles, barnacles and barnacles. Uh, really cool critters and I hate scraping them off, but we figure it's for the greater good. So uh, these are um, uh, cool little spirobus worms growing on the cyclophosphate sensor. Uh, so there's a number of ways that we can that uh, that we have to deal with these uh, fouling, particularly on the, on the uh, um, optical surfaces, such as on this uh, these fluorescent sensors on the WQMX, um, uh, such as this bio wiper. Uh, every, every measurement uh, get a nice clean swipe of the optics, like your like your, your car windshield wipers. There, uh, this is a cool little brush that that uh, uh, makes a pass through the optical path here on the Suna. Uh, nitrate sensor down there. They do a great job of keeping, keeping the optics clean. So what we have found though is probably the optimum service uh, interval um, is about three weeks. So these do require fairly regular maintenance uh, visits and uh, with more and more sites we're going to have uh, have to go out there and more um, in more inclement weather I guess you could say. Uh, so we will, these are serviceable and, you know, we've been out high winds, high waves, rain, um, still doable, uh, uh, in large part thanks to our volunteers here. Uh, we have uh, uh, Liberta Scotto here, uh, keeping a, a cycle phosphate sensor here, uh, nice and happy, happy, well tended to. Great volunteer, very dedicated. Uh, she got, went out with us here. This was the coldest day of the year, uh, this year, a few weeks ago. Uh, and on the right here, Bob White, uh, another amazing volunteer here. He's, uh, he's in the zone, he's, he's focused, he's uh, experiencing the zen of barnacle scraping here. And uh, he does a lot of behind the scenes work for us as well, uh, taping, painting, prepping sensors and stuff. He's a great, great guy. So you've seen a, few, a little bit behind the scenes and uh, now Kristen will come up and kind of talk about um, on everything. So Kristen first came to Harbor Branch as a summer intern as part of our summer intern program that you've heard about in the past. And she grew up in Pennsylvania, was going to school at Millersville University where she got her bachelor's degree. And then uh, when she was graduating, she wrote me a note one day saying, oh, she's starting to look for jobs. Would I write letters of recommendation? I said, well, yeah, but I'm starting this project up here pretty soon. And if you're interested, you know, maybe you might want to go back to Florida. And long story short, she did. And that now is 10 years ago. So she had her 10th anniversary here earlier in the month. And then we started this project right after she got here. So um, she's been invaluable in the project. And she's going to tell you a little bit about what she does. All right. So now that we've talked about kind of the general parameters that Lobo uh, units measure and how they were installed, now we're going to get into the part that's um, really exciting for me. And that's talking about the data that it's producing. And so anytime you're talking about um, producing data, we want to make sure that it's as high quality as possible. And so this involves a rigorous quality assurance, quality control, or QAQC plan. And so basically, um, QAQC refers to the processes or set of processes that are used to measure and assure the quality of a product, as well as the process of meeting products and services to meet consumer expectations. And this is a multi-tiered process, um, and it begins with uh, factory calibration, and that happens annually. So each, every year, we will take um, the Lobo sensor package apart and break it down to the individual instruments, and they will be sent back to the manufacturers that produce them. And at the manufacturer, they will undergo a rigorous set of calibration and characterization of the optics, the electronics, and any fluidics that are part of that. The next step is a semi-annual sensor verification, and that's done here at Harbor Branch um, by our staff or in other words, me and Ben. And so what we do um, is actually we take, we, um, we take the sensors and we run these through a series of tests, some um, that have uh, come from the manufacturer and some that we've developed on our own. And basically we take these instruments, we run a series of standard curves um, a lot of times as well as measuring several other parameters. And the reason we do this is just to ensure that these instruments are operating to the factory specifications. And so this happens uh, both before and after we send the instrumentation back to the factory, as well as every six months. So six months after the instrumentation's been deployed into the water, we will completely pull it up, replace it with another one. The Lobo will come back into the lab and we'll take off all those barnacles and we'll run all these tests and then Ben will prep them again and, and send them back. 
So what you can see here on the left, this is actually our WQMX. So you can see it's been taped but not painted yet. And it's sitting in a, a solution. This is kind of our little um, system that we've come up with. So the sensor is literally put into these solutions um, and to measure. Uh, all, and they basically range, at least with all the conditions that are all the solutions that we use, the reagents that we use, they're all uh, conditions that are found uh, in the Indian River Lagoon. So we want to make sure that the um, instruments are going to measure those conditions that we know are found um, in the lagoon. In the center, you can see this is our cycle phosphate sensor. Um, normally, when the cycle is deployed, the water is actually um, taken in by these filters right here, um, uptake through that. We can disconnect the intake filter, though, and connect it to a tubing that will go into all of the reagent um, standard, so we're able to, to run that in the lab. And then on the right, just um, kind of a process of how we do this. So the next step of our QAQC procedures includes our three-week maintenance that Ben mentioned before. And during this um, period, we um, again retrieve the Lobo from the water, and we do a series of sensor checks in the field, as well as um, what we call biofouling mitigation and what Ben calls a Zen barnacle scraping. So. Um, when we started off with this project, we actually were going with the manufacturer's recommendation, which was a six-week maintenance. And this was established because that is the amount of um, samples we're able to take um, with the cycle phosphate here. With the amount of reagents that we have, taking them uh, a measurement every hour, we're allowed, we have six weeks' worth of reagents um, for every deployment. And so we found out uh, that that wasn't um, quite up to par because we had a lot of biofouling issues. So that's why we've changed our and increased our frequency of, maintenance, of maintaining to every three weeks. So what happens during the maintenance is we retrieve the Lobo on deck here um, using the pulley system that Ben showed you earlier. And we go through a series of tests. So basically, we check the sensor performance before, as soon as we bring the Lobo on deck, so before any cleaning's been um, performed, as well as after the cleaning's been performed. And this allows us to um, account for any kind of um, drift to, uh, to the measurements that occurs because of biofouling. And then any um, the measurements after cleaning also tell us if there's any kind of drift with the instrumentation itself inside. And so we also do, uh, we perform the cleaning with a phosphate-free detergent that cleans the internal optical cell recycle here. And we do the same thing with our SUNA here. So everything gets hooked up to a computer. We're able to work on the really stable platform that is um, the RV Beezer. So our last step is our monthly validation. And this is a little bit different compared to the, the previous steps to our Q, QAQC program. Um, the earlier steps are actually using the instruments themselves to take measurements. What we're doing with our monthly validation is actually assessing the performance of the sensors in situ or while it's in the water column. And so what happens is we go out to the site and we use um, a couple different methods. We're basically taking a grab sample of um, of, and measuring it against what the Lobo is reading. So um, this is a picture of Nick Rogers. He's our intern, uh, was our intern this summer. He was from the Coast Guard Academy. And he was looking at some of our measurements that we were uh, taking for our dissolved oxygen um, sensors. But what he's doing is lowering a seabird CTD. And we're going to use that to validate our WQMX readings. And then we also take a grab sample right here with the Niskin sampler. So what happens is that the CTD and the Niskin sampler are lowered in the water column to the level of the Lobo. And at the exact time the Lobo is taking a measurement, we're also taking a measurement with the CTD as well as taking this grab sample. So what Ben will do is send a little weighted messenger down this line. It'll cause these two ends right here to close. So we're actually getting the sample of water that would be passing through the Lobo at that time. So when um, that happens, we bring the sampler back on deck, and we actually take a series of samples, starting with dissolved oxygen, followed by nutrients, and then for turbidity and chlorophyll. And we take these, uh, we take these water samples back to the lab and run a many uh, numerous analyses on them. So this is just an example of some of the data that's resulted from our validation efforts. Um, this is actually from our Linkport site. Our data timeline is about the course of the year. So this is from our pilot study from the Lobo at the end of the channel. As you can see, we've got our, our time series here on the x-axis, and we've got our dissolved oxygen measurements here on, on the y-axis, and showing you two different things. All the data in black is our hourly dissolved oxygen data that's coming from our WQMX. Um, and then also on these 12 red squares, these are, our val um, these are the results of our laboratory analyses from our validation sample. So you can see um, what you should see and what we are happy to see is that all of these are within, well within range of what we should be seeing, basically saying that our in-situ performance of these sensors are performing um, to our specifications. 
Um, another part, portion that's important is that data is coming in. There's going to be issues sometimes. So we want to be able to control any kind of issues that we're seeing um, with our data to account for any kind of variability that occurs either naturally or from um, any kind of sensor issues. And so this starts with our on daily visual checks of incoming data on LoboViz. And so this is basically um, what I do. And it's usually about pretty every hour I go and check out all the data, just make sure everything's looking OK. It's kind of addicting once you start doing it um, really often. So this is actually what you'll see if you go to our LoboViz site. You'll see all the site parameters. And you'll be able to plot them either by date. Um, and then you can plot as many parameters as you want or you can plot the parameters against one another. So I go through this and do an initial check just to make sure there's nothing going on with the instrumentation. If we see something going on, if we see a spike, or if we see something strange going on with one of the instruments, we can mobilize our team, again, Ben and I, to go out to the site and make sure that everything um, is operational, or if there's any issues, then we would fix it. Some of the other um, numerous things that we do for uh, quality assurance is just to look at um, some of the onboard standards we have. The cyclophosphate, our little wet chemistry in a can, is pretty interesting because we actually have onboard um, a NIST uh, traceable standard. So what happens is that normally for every hour we have from these yellow and the red cartridges, we have those two reagents which cause the colorimetric reaction that we use to measure phosphate. Every six measurements, we, after that measurement occurs, we add uh, a and this traceable standard to that as well. We call that our calibration spike. And so one of the ways we're able to remotely determine if our quality is good, our data quality is good, is to look at some of the measurements that we get. So this VAP04 down here, basically that is showing um, the calculation of the phosphate using a scale factor that was determined by our factory calibration. On the y-axis here, that is the phosphate that has been calculated using this, the results from this uh, calibration spike. So when we see a very direct linear relationship like this, we get really excited. We know that our data is up to par. And so if we see any kind of outliers, um, which isn't shown on this slide, we would know that that's maybe some questionable data. We can go back to the raw data files and kind of see what's going on with that and fix it as need be. Finally, um, we do take those grab samples. So we do follow a rigorous uh, laboratory QAQC pro um, process as well. We take multiple replicate samples to account for, um, to account for how precise our measurements are. We also take an equipment or method blanks. So basically, when we're taking our sample with our Niskin sampler, we're going to put a sample of analyte-free water in there. And the reason that we do this is so we can account for any kind of possible contamination that could be coming from our sampling procedures or from the laboratory um, equipment that we're using as well. We perform matrix spikes, similar to what we do with um, what I showed you on the, f on the previous slide with the um, cyclophosphate, and then we also do a comparison to known standards, and yes, that does include Diet Coke. Um, it's really strange when you try and do a check request for Diet Coke as part of your study. Um, they don't want to believe you, but Diet Coke is actually, we use it to verify, um, we use its fluorescence properties to um, verify the functioning of our chlorophyll sensor. And so now that we have the data, the data that's coming into LoboViz is provisional, and so there is some post-processing that must happen with some of this data. Um, that's what I spend um, a lot of my time on at this point. And I'm just going to show you some of our nitrate post-processing. So again, remember that our nitrate sensor is an optical sensor. It uses UV light um, and absorption to measure the amount of nitrate that's in the water column. And so nitrate is not the only thing that's absorbed by UV, uh, UV light. You also have um, color. Watercolor can be um, absorbed at those wavelengths as well as um, bromine, or bromide, excuse me. And so what we know is that Nitrate is not temperature dependent, but bromide is temperature dependent. And so we want to increase the accuracy of our nitrate readings. And to do this, we actually can um, use this temperature, correct, uh, temperature salinity correction algorithm to take the effect of the temperature dependent bromide out of the equation. And so um, this increases our accuracy of the SUNA greatly. And so um, we use the measurement, temperature and salinity measurements that are uh, measured concurrently using our WQMX to do this process. And this is just an example of that here. So at this point, uh, this is data from about a week's worth of time from our Fort Pierce site. Um, and so you can see, again, this is our time series, about a week's worth of time. And then our nitrate is on the y-axis. And so um, the black data is showing the original nitrate. So this is what you would see on LobaViz um, coming in. And then after we run that correction algorithm, you can see in the red data that's showing our corrected um, nitrate data. 
But one of the really cool things um, about this site is that you can see this daily increase and decrease, and that's all related to tidal fluctuations that we're seeing um, at Fort Pierce. So you can measure that in our nitrate data. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dennis. So I just want to um, kind of go over a couple of things that were presented by uh, my two colleagues. <clears throat> One is that um, we're actually doing a number of innovations with the, with the work, um, the pulley system and so on that Ben described. We're really the first ones to do that. Most of the time, divers do this. And very early on, I, I kind of came back and said to our engineers, can we do this so we don't have to put divers in the water? Uh, our divers get cold in the wintertime. But also, visibility is really an issue. And um, also, just having a person in between a boat when it's uh, rough weather, and we go out pretty much under any kind of condition, uh, and a fixed object like you've seen there, it, it's potentially a, a bit of a hazard. So um, you see how they greatly facilitated that. And Ben was actually also the first one to integrate a weather station into any of the Lobo technology. We just kind of assumed that that could be done. Um, we found out, you know, about a year after we did it that nobody else had done that before. So it's, it's good, but it allows us to get real-time uh, data. So you can get that on the weather station at the same stations that we have the water quality sensor. So you can, you can play with that and look at those relationships directly yourself. Uh, Kristen really pointed out the value of QAQC. It gets back to the need to be uh, accurate, precise, uh, to, to, for the data to be usable by all users. So that's a really high priority for us. And... Uh, I think that we're setting a lot of standards that other people will, will start to will start to follow. So um, I think it should be obvious that there's a lot of exciting technology here, but what I don't want us to lose sight of is that it's really the people that are using the technology and the, the innovations that the people are doing. So we're really lucky to have so much of this, and they, they mentioned a bunch of other people besides those of us who are talking today. So now I just want to just show you uh, yesterday. I just grabbed some of the data. I just went to LobaViz, just like we're inviting you to do. And I just took some, some screenshots. And one of them is just to plot depth. And uh, I did that for the three stations from Vero to Harbor Branch to Fort Pierce. And you can see very nice tidal patterns. If you look carefully, you'll see that the expected lag from the inlet uh, to Vero Beach is there. One could precisely measure that. Uh, I expect that our physical oceanographers will start to model that information because it has a lot to do with how, how is water exchanged. Today we're talking about water quality, but that could also be true for, say, plankton populations. Okay? How, how do things recruit into the lagoon? How far upstream can they go if they are just passive swimmers uh, and so on? And you know that we would expect then maybe a similar high and fall of salinity, right? Will it be quite as nice as those ups and downs? Uh, the tides? Well, this is what it looks like. This is salinity at the exact same time. And you can see that at Fort Pierce, where you're close to the inlet, yeah, you, can, you can see that there's a strong salinity signal, with obviously the salinity is being uh, higher at high tide and lower at low tide. You can see by the time you get to Harbor Branch, just five miles away, that you still see some of these highs in salinity. They're usually well, greatly curtailed, it looks like, and sometimes they disappear. And they usually disappear when we have certain types of wind situations, because actually a good part of the circulation of the lagoon, especially as you go further north away from the inlets in Brevard County, is actually driven by the wind, not by what happens with the, with the inlets, because there aren't very many inlets to the north of us. And Fort Pierce is the biggest inlet, about 50% of the water in the lagoon is exchanged there. And then you can go to Vero Beach, and you can see there's very little evidence of changing in salinity uh, in a tidal fashion. What does that tell us? I think it tells us that um, there's very little tidal influences in Vero Beach. Again, it's not that much further away than we are from the inlet. And you see that it's a, a much more consistent signal. So what's really happening there is a lot of that water is kind of just moving back and forth. You don't have the full tidal incursion coming from the oceans. Uh, this is uh, something I probably showed uh, in my talk two Januarys ago because uh, we had completed about 15 months of date at that point. And again, I'm going to stay with uh, the focus on salinity here because I think everybody can relate to salinity very well. You know, as the, as the season progresses, um, you, will, you will see, uh, as the wet season takes, takes impact, you'll see a great decline in salinity, kind of bottoms out during the main, main part of the wet season here. 
And then as we get into the dry season, salinities will, will return to a higher level. I told you earlier about the Coca-Cola color, the CDOM, the water color. And you can see, uh, without any kind of fancy statistics, how directly it is a mirror image of what's happening with fresh water coming into the lagoon. So again, it's just a, it's just a way, I think, to, to show you very dramatically something that we, you know, we would expect to see. What we're doing statistically uh, is trying to tease out a lot of other relationships. I'm going to show you a couple of those now, but there's a lot more to come. This one gets a little more complicated because now I'm going to plot three stations uh, for nitrate. And if we start to look for that, um, that tidal signal, you can see that, um, again, at Fort Pierce, there's very clear signs of tidal. Uh, Kristen had meant, mentioned that in her data set that she showed. And to some extent, you still see that in the, uh, the uh, Harbor Branch site, which is the, the red color. Uh, and again, at Vero, you see very much a, uh, a, not a lot of changes. So there's no tidal influence, which we already talked about with watercolor. But the other amazing thing is how much higher the uh, nitrogen level is in Vero Beach. And that's because of its proximity to, to uh, freshwater discharges. Now, you can also, just with a click yourself on the internet, say, let's plot that data a little differently. And we can ask it to plot nitrate versus salinity. So nitrate over here versus salinity. Now the, the different colors, again, are the different uh, stations. You can see each station kind of has its own pattern. Uh, and, uh, and Vero Beach is, is a little bit different than the other two. Um, they're, quite, they're quite distinct. But they all show a very clear relationship of nitrate um, with salinity. So that's something that will be teased out uh, a little bit further moving forward. So then I said to myself, well, we just now put Sebastian Station uh, online publicly Monday. And uh, what happens when we start to uh, throw yet another station on? Because at some point, they just get mind-boggling and beyond what we can easily comprehend. But I think even throwing this one on, you can see right away that this new station, which is up here, uh, Sebastian, uh, what's most strikingly obvious to me is I just told you, well, look how high the nitrate level is for Vero Beach here compared to the other two stations. Well, look what happens in Sebastian. We actually have a much elevated nitrogen level. And you can see that it's not all the time. It's certain times. And if we were to layer another bit of data on here, which would be rainfall, you might recall that recently we had some rainfall events right, right in these periods here. And that these uh, large um, discharges of nitrogen-rich water sometimes go on just for a couple of hours, or they might go on for a couple of days. My point is, is that if you're sampling four times a year, once a month, maybe even once a week, you're not going to see any of that. Okay. So this is one of the value of getting a lot of data points. Um, and uh, this is just one more example, uh, just taking just the new station, just the Sebastian station, just the last week of Sebastian uh, station. Another way, if you want to plot the data, you could, you could plot these three state parameters, uh, the CDOM or the watercolor, uh, nitrate, and salinity. And you can, you can see the obvious relationships, for example, of, um, of uh, nitrate with, um, with uh, lower salinity and higher CDOM or watercolor um, with, uh, with lower salinity. Uh, you can plot, again, just nitrate versus salinity. Shows you a very nice relationship um, that could be teased out through time. And lastly, I want to show you just something that um, we did um, kind of just by accident. It's one of those serendipitous things. This is seven days worth of phosphorus data. Um, from our original uh, Lobo site at the end of the channel here. And it's 168 data points. Okay, so I was telling you earlier, we, we were doing intensive sampling when we get one data point um, a week. And uh, Kristen said, well, we go out every month and we take a sample. Well, this happened to be, we took a sample that week. And that was our October sampling. And it just happened that that point was right there at the peak. So out of 168 data points that week, we just happened to be out when it was highest. So if we were doing this once a week, that would have been our assessment of phosphorus level. And it was only that way for a very brief part of that week, right? We could have sampled right there. And that would have given us a number that was, you know, 40% maybe of the first number. Or we could have been anywhere. So my point is that the more data you get, the better information you're going to have. The stronger your models are going to be and the, the shorter period of time. 
Some of these organisms, like phytoplankton, they're responding to things on the order of hours, okay? Not weeks, not quarters of year, not years. So it's really important. Um, so I think one of the real take-home messages of this should be that high-frequency monitoring provides much more data and captures events missed by that discrete grab sampling, okay? So I think the challenge actually is what are we going to do with this great volume of, of, uh, of information? Where we're going next with the system, we've told you about the four sites to the north that are online. Um, we're now working on deploying to the south in Martin County and southern St. Lucie County, all associated with St. Lucie Estuary. Here's a blow up of those sites. Our, our strategic deployment here is to put one at the base of the North Fork, which captures all the water flow coming in from the St. Lucie River up here, from some of the uh, nearby uh, watershed in the area in here. This is a, a fairly known uh, high source of nutrients, for example. We're going to go down to uh, here to capture the water that flows up from the South Fork. Uh, we're going to put another station closer to where the freshwater inputs actually arrive in the C44 uh, Canal, which is Lake Okeechobee which, as you know, is, uh, uh, has had some really high discharges in the last few years. They join together in Stewart near the Roosevelt Bridge. This sample here site is going to be, we call it the mid-estuary. It's near the Roosevelt Bridge. It's near an area that has uh, been used heavily for oyster restoration work and uh, is a site, for example, for Martin County does a lot of bacteriological sampling. So when you hear about closing of the water due to high bacteriological counts, this is one of the areas they always say is their highest priority. If, in other words, if they have very little money and can only sample one place, that's where it's going to be. So we've kind of put our instrumentation where we think it's going to be most useful to the greatest number of users. Then we have where the St. Lucie estuary flows out into the Indian River Lagoon. This area is called the Crossroads. Um, and our intent there, obviously, is to, is to capture the, what the impact of water quality is on the Indian River Lagoon from the St. Lucie estuary in total. And you know from uh, some of the work that Dr. Smith has done, Ned Smith, we believe that about 91% of that water that comes out of the St. Lucie estuary is discharged out via the St. Lucie inlet. Many of you have heard Dr. Voss and his students talk about the coral reefs, that the coral that grow out here. This is a state park, so a protected area. And uh, the impacts that uh, that water has, the black, so-called black water, has on the health of the corals here. So we think that'll be very useful to those folks. And lastly, when we had a, uh, a group of technical advisors come in last summer to help us place these stations, there was a strong suggestion made that we went with that we should put a station uh, further north than I had planned to do in Jensen Beach with the idea that people are very interested in knowing what, if that is 9%, whatever the number that is, we'll know better, but it'll also tell us what else about the water quality besides just the volume of water. You know, what does it do in terms of elevated nitrogen and phosphorus and so on? So that's, that's where we're going. That should all be online uh, by the end of the summer um, at the latest. We're also employing some new technology. We're going to have pH sensors. Uh, our current Lobos do not. It wasn't on my list before. The reason for that is that it's hard to get a really good pH sensor that can stand the rigors of being deployed, like Ben was talking about earlier. And they drift way too fast for, for what we're trying to do here. So there's this new technology that basically involves a chip, and um, we uh, will we be getting them very soon. We'll be testing them and deploying them. A lot of you know about the phenomenon of ocean acidification. There's been a lot of interest lately about estu estuaries maybe being more vulnerable to the effects of ocean acidification. So we'll be one of the first uh, uh, people in, in this part of the world to start to really address that. Again, it's really important that we do this long term. It's very important that we establish a baseline. So to wrap some of this up, um, we think that this technology will provide all of us, so researchers like myself and all the agencies that are working in the lagoon, but also the public, uh, the biggest users of, the, of other networks, for example, the one on the west coast of Florida, is uh, by two groups. People who use satellites to look at like what's going on in the water from space, they want somebody down there ground truthing the information. So this is a good way to ground truth that because we're getting 24-7 information and the satellites come over at certain times and regardless of when that is, you can get real-time data, okay? So that's one big user group. But the other big user group is actually fishermen. Fishermen very quickly key into water quality. 
fishermen are very knowledgeable about water quality issues. Uh, sometimes if you want to know what's going on in the lagoon, you know, talk to the fishermen. So we expect that uh, certain parts of the public will be particularly interested in this, and also students. So we already incorporate this in some of our activities here, education-wise, and some of our some of our offerings. But I can see where teachers throughout this part of the of Florida could start to develop their own lesson plans about this. So it got really cold last week. How cold did it get? How fast did it chill down? Did it chill down equally near the ocean versus further inland? What happened? Um, you know, when we had three days off because of a tropical storm. How fast did the salinity go down in the lagoon? How fast did it take to recover? They could plot the tides, okay? There's all kinds of things that you could do. Um, and students can just do this, you know, from their phone, from their computer. This is, as I said, freely available during a public, publicly accessible website. One of the things we're going to be able to do is not only follow environmental changes here in the lagoon, but we have colleagues that are doing the same thing on the west coast of Florida in the Caloosahatchee system which is the other side of the discharges from Lake Okeechobee. So we get some in the St. Lucie estuary. Most of those discharges actually go to the Caloosahatchee. So we'll be able to use similar technology to look at phenomena. Again, what happens if we have a, a historic wet season? What happens if we have a, a, a hurricane that goes up the center of the state and just sits in Orlando for a while? Where's all that water go? It comes down here, and then it goes out east and west from Okeechobee. We hope that all this will be used to better manage the Indian River Lagoon and the St. Lucie Estuary. We think that this will be very helpful to the modelers that are interested in biological, chemical, and physical phenomena. And as I've already alluded to, we think it will be a great platform for education and outreach activities, including uh, folks like yourself uh, in this lecture. I usually like to have a quote near all my talks. Eh, it's time at Jogi Bear. You know, I've gone with Kermit the Frog. I've gone with Leonard Cohen. You know, Yogi Bear. You can observe a lot by just watching. So we invite everybody to watch and, and learn as much as you can and to start to share it with us. So there we are. We're done for the day, heading off to another uh, Lobo mission. We'll start our deployments to the south soon. The next time we get together on this topic, you know, I hope to be able to tell you that things went well, and here's what's going on. Here's what we've seen. Here's what we discovered. But I also look forward to hearing what some of your discoveries are. So stay tuned on that. I want to thank a bunch of people. Uh, we've had four main sources of funding to get what you saw today happen. All that's happened since two Januarys ago when I last got up here. Uh, at that time, we had just launched with uh, help from, well, not help, the money came totally from Harbor Branch uh, to get, this, get the pilot project started. We then got a... Um, a grant from our foundation here, the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation, that allowed us to do everything you saw today in terms of the Indian River County and Fort Pierce part of the network. Uh, so we really are very grateful to the foundation for that. Um, we have had uh, a number of years of support from the Save Our Seas plate. So if you are an SOS purchaser, uh, everyone, everyone calls it the shark plate. I call it the seaweed plate, but you know, it's a shark plate. Um, we really thank you, thank you for your support. Um, our state funding that we received in the past year has uh, come to us via the Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, and we have a, some pending support from the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, we've identified some of the folks that have provided invaluable technical support. Um, you know, uh, Ben mentioned Dave Burdett, Jeff Smith, Mike Young. Th these guys are incredible craftsmen. They've been here a long time. They can build just about anything, and they know how to do it well and efficiently and inexpensively. Jimmy Nelson, you saw, was helping in the installation, the fabrication. He's the guy who designed that, redesigned that boat to make it available for us as the research vessel Beezer, as we'd like to call it. Uh, Jeff Peaser was uh, helped in the initial deployment of this project as well. Uh, Laberta and Bob were identified as two of the volunteers that we have. And uh, they, they've been very, very helpful to us in the field. Um, the the uh, John Hart also works in my lab, and he's helped out in some of the field work as well. Also, our Erlo collaborators. Uh, Brian was here at the 4 o'clock lecture. Brian LaPointe, Laura Heron, and Marie Tarnowski. And uh, many of you have heard uh, different lectures from that group in the past that tie into this work. So it really is quite a team effort. That's one of the main messages I want to get across to everybody is that it really does take quite a network of, of team, both in terms of uh, support for money, 
but um, more importantly for the people themselves and, and using the technology the way it can be used. So we invite you to follow us as we uh, continue our journey. Questions? <laughs>